Great. Well, thanks, Hannah. So, yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm here today to kind of talk to you a little bit about vertical farming in the urban environment. Um, I guess a good place to start would be a bit of a background to myself. So I'm a Londoner. I grew up in North London, East Finchley. Um, I don't have a horticultural background or an agricultural background, um, but I've always enjoyed kind of growing food um, and kind of gardening and, and being out of nature in, in general. Where I grew up, there's lots of sort of green space and I was fortunate enough to have a, a mum and a grandmother who were really into um, growing vegetables and sort of some of my earliest memories are of pinching tomatoes from my granny's greenhouse. And um, I think that's really where I sort of fostered an interest in agriculture, really. Um, so at university, I studied environmental sciences um, and my early sort of professional career was based in environmental and sustainability consultancy within the built environment. And again, there I was sort of kind of working on and fostering that interest in in the kind of nature and bringing that into the into the urban environment. Um, and I, I was fortunate enough in one of my first roles within that industry to meet um, a really pioneering guy called Tom Webster, who is the, one of the co-founders of a company called Grow Up Farms, and they're one of the sort of UK innovators in, in vertical farming. Um, turned out they were looking at some really interesting and sort of early vertical farming projects to deliver in London, and I was just in the sort of right place and right time and, and was able to get on board. Um, and since then, I've sort of I've, I've worked with a few companies within, within the industry and I've got now about eight years experience of vertical farming under my belt um, and predominantly that's within the urban context. So what I'll do today is sort of um, use my sort of insights and experiences to draw um, to draw on and, and hopefully use a few examples to kind of bring what I'm some of what I'm talking about to life. Um, so, yeah, we'll get underway. So firstly, I guess it would be good, less talking about myself, maybe more about the company that I now work for. So I work for a company called Let Us Grow. Um, we have a fairly straightforward mission statement, and that is to reduce the waste and carbon footprint of fresh produce by empowering anyone anywhere to grow delicious food near the point of consumption. And how we do that is through um, a technology that we've developed uh, called aeroponics, and we utilize aeroponics within the context of vertical farming. Um, and yeah, it's it's really exciting. So I guess one step back before I talk a little bit more about vertical farming and, and sort of how it differs from traditional agriculture, I thought it was worth just sort of touching on, on, on why myself and, and also Let Us Grow sort of um, have trodden this path and are, are really keen to sort of push this industry and, and, and keep the wheels moving forward in that, you know, the, the industrial food system that we have currently to feed a global population is is, is outdated, it's inefficient, and it's, it's sort of failing people and the environment. Um, this is a, you know, we live now in a globalized society and everyone, you know, there's no seasonality now with, with regards to what people want on their dinner plates and, and to kind of feed that insatiable desire for food all times of the year um, and all over the world. Um, a lot of how we're, we're growing that food is in, in incredibly destructive to both the environment, but also to, to people and communities. I guess if you couple that sort of destructive model with a globalized urban population um, who are increasingly distanced with where their food comes from, there's a real lack of transparency and traceability within our food system. And I think this goes a long way to sort of contribute to this um, extinction of experience. And that's a term I sort of first came across when I was doing my thesis, which was around the role of allotments in urban biodiversity conservation. And it relates more generally to a lack of experience in, or a lack of um, opportunity for experience with nature in urban environments and experiences with nature from an early age particularly are really important if we're to foster an understanding and, and a caring for for nature and I, I I definitely see the kind of the parallels between a wider understanding and care for nature and the environment and and an understanding and an interest in where our food comes from because the two are inextricably linked so yeah this sort of distanced globalized urban population um, we're increasingly sort of, yeah, we know less and less about where our food comes from and it's really difficult to sort of find that information. So what, you know, in the UK, kind of how that, those two sort of factors have manifested themselves is that 30% you know, of all the food that we produce goes to waste. Um, we import 60% of the food that we, the vegetables that we eat, and that's to sort of meet the demand that we have for, for seasonless vegetables. So sort of growing, producing and importing food accounts for about 30% of our country's global, um, carbon footprint. 
climate change and Brexit are, are kind of exacerbating some of these issues and, and making it even trickier um, to think about sustainable solutions for food production. Um, and on top of this, sort of going back to that extinction of experience, 10% of 11 to 14 year olds don't know that carrots grow underground. Um, it's just one, one stat that I could pull from a survey or full of remarkable stats. Um, we've got an obese population of 25% and, you know, the sort of, we're increasingly urbanizing and by 2050, 80% of all the food that we, we produce, well, we consume rather, will be in, in urban areas. And, and actually urban space is the fastest growing landmass globally. So you can see this is a problem that's sort of only going to kind of get worse in the future unless we can think about innovative solutions to sort of help take the pressure off our, our environment. So what is vertical farming? I guess I'm sure a lot of you have seen photos of these kind of strange chambers where we're growing leafy greens, but what, what does that sort of entail? Well, typically they're grown inside a controlled environment. So we're controlling the lighting, the, the temperature, the humidity, the water, the nutrients, um, everything really. And again, we're typically stacking these growing areas on top of one another to maximize sort of footprint and productivity per meter squared. Often they're using soilless systems, so utilizing technologies such as hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics. Again, some terms you, you may have heard of, and I'll go into a bit more detail about how those are different. Um, but essentially, removing soil and supplementing that with a, a nutrient, um, a new nutrient source that's delivered via via water or mist. Um, we typically use LED lighting to replace. The, the wavelengths of light provided by the sun in an, in an outdoor field system. And, and within our systems, we use a technology called aeroponics, where the, the roots are suspended in a nutrient dense mist. And I'll, I'll come on to that in a bit more detail. Um, again, yeah, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about the other irrigation techniques. But the gist of it is that we can optimize a climate for a crop or a set of crop types to basically make sure that we're maximizing the productivity um, and in doing so, we're reducing waste. So how does that sort of compare to a conventional open field system? Well, obviously we've got that controlled element with regards to sort of day length, the spectrum of light that the plants receive, the temperature, CO2, um, water and relative humidity. It means that we can sort of, we much better picture um, around the kind of uniformity of the crop that we produce. And this is really important I guess you guys may have heard in the, in the news recently more and more about the, the, the very strict quality um, assurance standards of supermarkets and lots of wonky veg getting thrown away. So making sure veg is, is grown how we want it or the mass market wants it or the retailers wants it helps reduce waste. Um, so that's really important. We can use less water up to 90% in many instances because that water is captured and recirculated. Because it's in a controlled environment, we don't use any pesticides um, or kind of herbicides, fungicides, that sort of thing. By, by removing the crops from the environment, you're also removing it from the sort of the kind of uh, the detrimental sort of factors within an environment, such as pests and adverse weather, that sort of thing. Um, it's typically higher energy use at the point of growth. So one of the things that people always bring up with me and, and is right is that there's a lot of energy going into powering these farms, particularly with the LED lighting that we're using. Um, and where that energy comes from has a massive impact as to the sustainability of these systems. Um, if we can power them from renewable energy, they're incre it's an incredibly sustainable way of, of growing produce. If that energy is being produced, you know, um, by burning fossil fuels, it's less so. Um, but as the grid the UK energy grid mix increasingly goes green. Um, the kind of environmental impact of these systems is, is kind of greatly increased as well as the carbon impact. Um, but by kind of removing, by kind of dislocating the environment from specific geographies, it means that we can grow food pretty much anywhere, um, whether that's a basement, a rooftop, uh, industrial space, um, existing sort of agricultural buildings means that we can take the production indoors, control that space, and, and we can put that next to the point of distribution and con or consumption. And that can really help to sort of minimize food miles, which contribute a massive amount to the overall kind of carbon, embodied carbon within the produce that we eat. 
So we've talked, you've heard me mention a few sort of irrigation techniques, hydroponics, aquaponics, and they may be terms you've heard before and heard bounded around. And I just wanted to sort of outline the key differences to help kind of set the story a bit more. These are all techniques that are used currently within vertical farming. Um, hydroponics is where you replace soil with a, a nutrient dense water. And that water is, is used to flood the root zone of the plants periodically uh, with a flood and drain system or what we call a nutrient film technique where you drip a small amount in on a consistent basis. The idea is that within that, that water, we've we've included all the micro and macronutrients that the plants need to grow and thrive. Um, and we also adjust the pH so that the water is at a, a balance where the plants can, can most readily uptake those nutrients. Aquaponics is slightly different in that the nutrients come from rearing fish. So when fish um, eat food, they excrete ammonia. That ammonia can be converted into nitrogen um, through biofiltration. So bacteria convert ammonia into nitrates. Um, and those nitrates can then be used as the kind of key feedstock for, for plants. So it's quite a nice sort of circular nutrient cycle there. Um, and aeroponics is slightly different in that, and it's kind of more closely related to hydroponics. And what we're doing in, hyd in aeroponics is that we're, again, we're dosing water with uh, the, the correct sort of nutrient mixes and, and getting adjusting the pH. But then instead of flooding the root zone, what we do is we, uh, we, we use... Um, either high pressure systems or low pressure systems like our own to generate a mist. And that mist is then flooded into the root zone um, and creates a highly oxygenated environment where the plants can take up water, nutrition and, and, and oxygen. So I've got a video here, bear with me, it might just take a moment to load, but what I've got is just a video of, of this aeroponics in action. Um, hopefully you guys can see this. Um, Hannah and Natalia just stop me if it's not working, but what you can see here is inside our research facility. Um, and what we've got here is our aeroponic grow bed. So as you can see, when those trays are lifted up, the, the nutrient dense mist is escaping from that tray. But what, what that nutrient dense mist is doing is, is providing that highly oxygenated root zone for the plants um, where they can take up nutrients, but as, but as more importantly, oxygen. And you can see the roots are sort of super white and they've got these tiny little sub roots coming off that we call root hairs. And what you've got in these really aerated zones is a, is a, is a really healthy root network. And because the plants don't have to stress too much about um, kind of guarding its roots against um, saturation from too much water, it's kind of got that optimal zone. It can put more energy into the vegetative growth. And obviously that's the growth that as growers we're concerned about. Um, so, so what does that look like within the urban environment, within the, the context of vertical farming? So I've always kind of laid, the, laid the, the kind of the story that within vertical farming, you're controlling all of these different factors. If you look at this sort of simplified graph, what you can see with yield over time, there's a number of factors that kind of contribute to how much yield you can get. So whether it's the amount of nutrients you put in, the airflow that you're managing, the amount of light you give a plant, um, or how you, you irrigate. And actually, what we can get with aeroponics over hydroponics is, is an optimized root zone. And that gives us a, a general uplift in the yields that we can expect from these systems. So in short, it just it improves the productivity, essentially. Um, again, just another short sort of gif of, of, of that in action. Um, we've been doing trials with Harper Adams University to kind of demonstrate this in, in the greenhouse setting. So what we have on the right hand side is aeroponically grown kale. And on the right hand side, we've got a hydroponically grown kale and you can see that the aeroponically grown kale is, is developing a lot quicker um, and from this trial we found that there was about a 20 percent uplift in the yield of the final crop um, with the aeroponics compared to the hydroponics so really promising data there um, and we're continuing to run those trials with, with sort of academic partners so that's a sort of brief synopsis of of uh an introduction to let us grow and, and vertical farming and how it all fits in. So just to sort of summarize the benefits of indoor farming, um, we can use up to 95% less water uh, than with kind of conventional agriculture, and that's by recapturing and repurposing that water. We can also use harvested rainwater, particularly that's been particularly relevant in urban areas where you know we can do a little bit to help reduce um, runoff into rivers and floods and that sort of thing. Uh, 
We don't have to use pesticides or herbicides or harmful chemicals because we're eliminating the pests from the growing environment in the first place. It means that we can reduce the amount of runoff into the environment. So anything that's sprayed on open field systems is, is depending on the weather and the saturation of the soil is likely at some point to end up in a, in a water course, which can be highly polluting to the environment. So by, by separating food production from the environment, we're, we're mitigating that risk of, of contamination. We can grow close to the point of consumption, um, which results in less food waste. So if food is growing close to the point of consumption, we can uh, basically extend the shelf life. We reduce the risk of that food getting damaged and thereby uh, reducing the amount of waste associated with, with that sort of food type. Particularly, particularly relevant with sort of salads and herbs, which are the sort of main crops grown in vertical farms at the moment, highly perishable um, and often the sort of thing that kind of go soggy in people's fridges or can get damaged in a bag quite easily. Um, kind of going back to the point I made previously, it takes pressure off, off the environment, particularly depleted soils and farmlands, which through conventional agriculture, we're increasingly have to add nutrition to our soils as the soils become depleted. Um, so yeah, removing that, that pressure can help us to, to farm land in different ways and, and maybe put more land over towards sort of um, the regeneration of, of natural systems um, and overall hopefully by growing locally we can reduce the carbon footprint of of, of the produce that we eat um, and that's of course true for for any urbanly urbanly grown produce whether it's in a raised bed a polytunnel or in a in a vertical farm um, i thought it was just important to sort of touch on the different scales of vertical farming again what we often see on the telly is the larger scale systems the biggest farm in the world or well, that sort of thing. There's lots of claims to the biggest vertical farms. Um, each week there's a new one. Um, but I've tried to sort of demonstrate here the different scales. At the lower end, we've got the drop and grow, which is our example of a shipping container farm. That's our shipping container farm product that we've developed. Um, and the sort of design and build spaces where you can include these vertical racks into, into, into uh, disuse spaces within the urban environment, such as basements, roof spaces, uh, car parks, that sort of thing. And this is a scale which I think is particularly suitable to the urban environment uh, and where I found that urban environment systems work best. Um, we're really then <clears throat> utilising space that is, is redundant. We're not competing for space. Um, and actually these systems can offer a lot more in terms of social impact because they're a lot more accessible. Um, they're easier to manage and run. They still have the same impact in terms of connecting people with food production as well as offering us a, a space for people to kind of reconnect with with nature and, and foster an interest and understanding in horticulture and hopefully more widely agriculture as we kind of go towards a larger scale we're moving into much larger um, automated vertical farms which will be increasingly cut off to the public and that's purely because of, of things like food safety um, and biosecurity you, with these larger facilities, you don't really want people wandering around um, having a look. You'd be surprised how easy it is for an aphid to hitch a lift on your jumper and get into one of these facilities and cause absolute havoc. So they're a lot more closed off. Um, so in that respect, they're less useful for the training engagement activities um, and as well as sort of reconnecting people with food production. But because of their, their scale, the volume of produce that they produce is critical if we're to, if we're to start to meet sort of levels of of demand that we have currently within our food system for for leafy produce and herbs and that sort of thing we can't grow it all in an urban environment we'll need some larger farms in the sort of peri-urban um or sort of industrial landscapes to sort of kind of uh, service that need um so if you think about this on a, a sort of scale towards the right the larger the farm maybe the greater the environmental impact uh, but but the lower the social impacts in terms of um, engagement and training opportunities. Um, and towards the left-hand side of the screen, the smaller systems, possibly lower environmental impact in terms of the amount of volume they can displace, um, but the kind of greater opportunity there is for um, training and engagement and, and, yeah, generally integrating these into urban environments. So that's the sort of kind of quick overview of, of vertical farming and the different scales and different technologies and where we at Let Us Grow fit in. Um, I just wanted to now <clears throat> quickly run through a few of the case study farms that I've worked on in urban environments to hopefully 
let me give you guys some ideas of the different shapes and sizes that they come in. Um, so this is a picture of the first urban vertical farm that I managed. Um, this is the grow up box. It was based in Stratford um, on a disused car park. The car park is still um, is still an active space you can go, although the containers now have been moved on to another site. Um, but this was an early example of an aquaponics project. So what we had is about 150 tilapia fish in a fish tank inside the shipping container. And then above the shipping container, we had a, a greenhouse with vertical hydroponic growing uh, stacks. Um, and in there, we were growing all sorts of things from mustards um, and other sort of brassicas, so kales, um, mizunas, those sorts of things. You can see there we had some beautiful rainbow chard. Um, we also in the summer grew lots of basil. Um, through the winter, we grew parsley. Um, and the bottom right there, you can see some beautiful pat choy that I grew um, for a local Thai restaurant um, who also took the fish. Um, so we were growing all sorts of different types of produce. And really the, the aim of this project was as a, a kind of a, a community engagement piece. So in 2014, when we delivered this project, kind of aquaponics and urban farming in, in, term, in terms of the vertical farming context was maybe in its infancy. And we really wanted to bring people in and show people what we were doing and what it was all about. Um, it was also really important for us as a demonstrator project in terms of getting customers on board. So a lot of this produce that was grown was supplied to local restaurants. So getting their feedback was critical to inform our sort of business plan and modeling um, to help us scale up the business um, and, and build a bigger farm, which is what we did next. So the bigger farm that we then went on to build was housed in a warehouse in Beckton. So sort of at the end of the DLR um, over by City Airport. And this was sort of, if we're thinking about that sliding scale I showed a couple of slides back, this was somewhere in the middle, about a thousand meters squared worth of growing area. So much more closely aligned to a commercial scale than more of a community scale. But um, yeah, and obviously we were growing a lot more produce, um, about 20 tons of salad per year and four tons of fish. Um, a lot of that salad went to um, the local restaurants that we'd started to build relationships with from the, from the grow up box. Um, as well as taking on other sort of customers within the wholesale and um, retail space as well. Um, we did still conduct um, kind of public tours and stuff of this space, but again, we were a lot more careful with that. They weren't so open. We didn't, so many, didn't do so many workshops where people could come and sort of taste the produce and, and kind of really get involved. Um, but what was really cool about this project was that we, we hired, we, we made sure that we hired really locally. Um, and to help me run the farm as farm manager, I had um, four amazing farm technicians, three of who you can see there. These are all young guys employed from the local um, community and environment, uh, none of whom were previously in training, education or employment. Um, we worked with them to sort of develop their horticultural skills specifically around our systems. And we worked with horticultural trainers um, and fish husbandry trainers to kind of build a pr program of, of training. Um, and so these guys left with some amazing skills in horticulture. Uh, and yeah, it was a great opportunity for some, some young people from an urban environment who maybe hadn't thought about a, a sort of career in agriculture. Um, it was a really, really nice and, and cool way of getting them involved in, in the industry. Um, in fact, the chap you can see in the middle there on top of the scissor lift, uh, Andrew, he's now the farm manager here at, at Lettuce Grow. So it's, it's an industry that's growing and there are there is, an, there is an opportunity to become part of a, a growing industry. Um, there's a skill shortage. Um, and more widely within agriculture, there is a skills shortage and an aging kind of workforce. And so it's really critical that we get people, particularly young people, and I'd argue young people from an urban environment thinking about horticulture and agriculture as a, um, a sort of a, a career choice, basically. Um, so yeah, this was essentially a, a big system. And what we had, just quickly touch on the size of it. We had yeah, about 800 square meters of growing area um, and the benches were stacked up to five meters tall. So we we're accessing those with that, that scissor lift that you can see there um, to harvest and seed all the crops. So it was quite an operation. Um, and we went from about 150 fish to about three and a half thousand fish, um, which is a lot of fish to look after. But um, yeah, they were, they were a crucial part of this aquaponics um, setup in that they provided nutrients for the plants. They're also a protein source, which we sold locally to, to, um, to Thai restaurants. 
Um, I guess an interesting point here that I, I reflect on is that in 2015, when we were thinking about how can we grow or how can we produce protein in a more sustainable way for, for urban populations, aquaponics was really seen as a, as a sort of viable option. And I'd, I'd argue now that the kind of conversations moved on beyond aquaponics to thinking about plants as the, the kind of optimal source of, of protein. Um, and I'd be interested to see how large scale aquaponics projects are received um, in the current climate with a move towards uh, veganism and the kind of understanding that we have now around um, or the kind of more widespread and mainstream understanding we have now around the, the possible benefits of, of uh, moving towards plants for our protein. Um, so I'll rattle through a couple more for you guys just to give you a bit more of a flavour. So this was a container farm that I ran in Bristol. So again, we've gone back to a smaller scale. This is a hydroponic farm. You can see the hydroponic growing area looks very similar to the, the previous farm, just on a much smaller, smaller scale. And it was, it was sort of designed by the same people. Um, but this was an interesting use case in that the farm was situated on a piece of, of brownfield land. So this land was designated for redevelopment as part of um, a big project that's now being undertaken within the Bristol city centre region to, to um, kind of redesignate what was kind of light industrial land towards housing and, and education. Um, but this land was basically being un, was unused and was owned by Homes England and, and they allowed us to site our farm there for, for a peppercorn rent. I think we paid something like a pound a year to be there. And the benefit for us is that we got access to a, a super um, central site in the middle of Bristol, which we would have otherwise not been able to afford. Um, and for the, for the landowner, they got a kind of a guardian and a custodian of the site. Um, and they were happy to know that the site was being used for something productive. Um, and much like the previous container farm I showed you, this, the aims here were, were really about kind of pioneering the, the business model around small scale um, urban vertical farm production and distribution but with a real focus on sort of training and engagement and sort of outreach. Um, so yeah, we were doing about 100 kilos a month of, of produce here and selling that to local restaurants and, and retailers. Um, but the kind of main core activities were around reconnecting people with food, trying to just start a dialogue about food production and being as transparent as possible about how we were doing it within our system and how that was different from what people's perceptions of agriculture may or may not have been. Um, and over the kind of three years that we were operating, we managed to get over 50 volunteers, interns, and work experience people through the door. Uh, and that was everyone from sort of university undergraduates uh, through to um, people from the local community with, with um, uh, who are kind of not finding a kind of their place within the community weren't again they were not in education training or, or kind of employment so we were kind of we had lots of outreach programs where people could come and get on board um and there were lots of different tasks that everyone could get involved with and we also sort of ran a, a pretty good sort of school and, and public um engagement program where we had people around every week um to yeah to sort of shout about what we were doing and and get people's questions and feedback and generally just have a discussion about the farming in the urban environment um, and this lastly one I'd like to just touch on is, is a project we're currently running. So this is a, a Let Us Grow project up in, in York um, with one of our container farms that's utilising the aeroponic technology that we've developed. Um, and this is based in the centre of York. It's a sort of action research space, which is a collaboration between uh, a sort of incubator programme for uh, startup businesses and the university. And the idea is that the university can use this space for sort of action research, um, but it's also a space for engagement. Uh, with the local community and the produce then goes into the, the container park where it's housed and goes to local restaurants and you can see there some some basil that's been grown that goes to the, the pizza pizza place on site so um, yeah it's just another interesting way of how you can integrate these systems into the urban environment um, and again this is this is a container park so it it was it was easy to put up it was possibly using some redundant space that was otherwise you know not that useful um, so yeah, I just, it's a nice example of, of how, uh, yeah, another example of how these sort of systems can be sort of incorporated. Um, yeah, that sort of kind of wraps up my presentation. Um, if we've got some time for questions, um, and yeah, I can go back and revisit any slides if, 
if anybody would like to take a closer look or has specific questions. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. That was really interesting. We've actually already got quite a few questions in the chat, so I'll wow. stop working through these and I'll um, ask them. And if anyone else has questions while we're going through these, then um, feel free to put your hands up or keep typing in the chat and we'll work our way through. Um, the first question we had, which is quite early on um, from Lloyd Phillips was, um, firstly, a comment that it's fantastic that vertical farming removes farming from insects that are deemed as pests, but asked about beneficial insects such as bees. So when we're looking at fruit bearing plants like berries, um, it, like firstly, I guess, is it possible to grow them inside these? And if so, how are they pollinated without bees being around? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. Um, thanks for that one. So. Yeah, there, there's definitely some insects that we want to kind of keep out of the space. Um, uh, but there's also in, insects that we definitely want to introduce. And so because we don't use pet, kind of chemical pesticides and herbicides, we actually use a um, deploy a technique called integrated pest management. And what we do there is we introduce the pests or the predators of our pests. So an example there would be aphids. Aphids are incredibly destructive to a crop. Um, one aphid can sort of spawn 3,000 young in the course of a week. So you can see how they can quite quickly multiply, especially in the context of what is essentially eternal summer within one of these systems. So for aphids, we, we deploy parasitic wasps, lacewing larvae and ladybirds, and we introduce those into the system so we can try and balance out. We you kind of get that natural predator prey balance that you get in the, in the natural environment. Um, obviously the aim is not to have any pests in there but invariably one or two will always get in so on that front we do introduce beneficial um, insects into the environment um, when it comes to pollinating crops uh, the crops that need pollinating like fruits um, and, and vegetables yeah it, exactly right as with glass houses in vertical farms we can introduce bees and other pollinating insects to pollinate those sorts of crops um, in the UK a lot of the focus has been around leafy salads and herbs to date with regards to sort of what crops we grow in, in, a, in a vertical environment. Um, and that's predominantly because that's where the most value could be had at the moment and other costs around the operating of those systems mean that those are the key crops. But certainly in the states where things like energy is a lot cheaper, people are already developing and, and growing fruiting crops um, such as tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers. Um, we've tried them here in Bristol, they work really well. Um, so as those crops come online, which they will with time as the technology evolves and we move towards kind of cleaner renewable energy, um, then yeah, bees will certainly be, become um, part of the mix and, and something we'll consider to for kind of uh, use it in the vertical farms. So the one, one point I'd like to make there is that there's still a lot of research going on around how um, the different LED light recipes can affect um, insect navigation. Um, and so there's a lot of research to be done there as well around what we know what light the plants like the best, but what light do the insects like the best and what's the sort of balance that we can achieve there to create a much more kind of um, friendly environment for the insects as well as the plants. That's really interesting, really good answer. I like wouldn't even have necessarily thought about all of that. So yeah, it's definitely interesting to hearing about all the different complexities and things that work together for it. Um, the next question that we have from Sarah, I think this was around a specific slide. Um, so it says that in the figures, there's a difference in the size of crops uh, between the figures. And is this representative of difference in crop yields related to the different types of vertical farming? Or is it just a coincidence with the formatting? Yeah, um, I, I think it's probably a coincidence of the formatting, but good, good spot. Um, with regards to kind of the different yields, it's, it's kind of generally understood in what our our research has shown to date is that you can you can increase your yield productivity with aeroponics over hydroponics. Hydroponics and aquaponics is slightly different because essentially the irrigation system is the same. You've just got a different source of nutrition. So aeroponics is understood to be the kind of optimal form of, of irrigation method to, 
to combine with the rest of the, the factors um, to achieve the highest yields. Um, but it's such a complex story, you know, changing the temperature can have a massive impact on, on the sort of, on the yield or the lighting recipe or the airflow or the variety of seeds you use. Um, so there's, there's a co whole combination of factors that go into a vertical farm that mean that, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways you can tweak the system to get different outcomes. But generally in, in systems that mirroring each other for certain crops, certainly uh, aeroponics is, is an advantageous method to deploy. Um, that doesn't mean it's suitable for all crops. Um, it's, it's a method and a methodology, but it's not necessarily always the best course of action for all crops. Um, it really depends on a whole sort of wide variety of factors um, outside of the farm as well as inside of the farm. Thank you. Um, so we've still got a few more questions in the chat. So I've got a few from Michael in here. So the first one is, how much is the upfront cost to create one large aeroponic container? I'm guessing quite a lot of caveats on this. <laughs> well, I guess well, I can I can try and be as caveatless as possible and, and open with that one. And so our we have a, a container farm, an aeroponic container farm with 24 meters squared of growing area. The starting price for that is is 85,000 pounds. So it's a lot. It's a lot of money. Um, but the advantage there is that you've got uh, the opportunity to to grow lots of crops year round, uh, and you're not affected by the season. So, um, how profitable that farm is depends on a number of factors in terms of you know are there rent costs? So kind of business operating costs. Um, you know we can model all those things. We have quite an in depth farm economic model which we use with our customers to sort of plan and forecast how they might deploy these units and and what would be a profitable scenario for them. But it depends on things like the kind of price you can achieve with your off takers. So who's going to buy the produce and, and how much are they willing to pay for that? How much are you paying for your energy? Is that off the grid or are you able to access cheaper renewable energy? Do you have to pay site costs in, in um, uh, you know, the form of rent and that sort of thing? And, and sort of how many jobs do you want to create within this business and, and what sort of wage will you be paying your staff? So it really depends on a, a scenario by scenario basis. And I think with the early stage, where we are at as an industry, you know, still, still fairly nebulous and new and often at, at the moment, the onus is on the operator to play the upfront cost. But one of the things that I'm really interested in and, and kind of a focus of mine is understanding the wider ecosystem around these container farms um, that's needed in terms of finance, in terms of market for the produce, in terms of siting, and actually who, who should then pay for these, pay for these systems. Um, how can we get them financed so that they are more available to communities? Because the cost at the moment can certainly be seen as a, a quite significant barrier for certain um, uh, operators who wish to use them. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, maybe, maybe there was quite a few caveats there in the end, but um, that's that's kind of where we're at with that one. Yeah, that one question I have off the back of that actually is. Um, have you done any kind of like community owned or like community share sort of projects or have they mainly been kind of one one organisation as tend to like pay the upfront cost and then the kind of community stuff is like secondary? Um, so, yeah, we've delivered a few community projects. One that comes springs to mind is the Welcome to Our Woods project, which we delivered in Wales. Um, that was grant funded and the container was we supplied some of the equipment and there was some other hydroponic equipment in there. Um, and that's a community led project. I think it's with community led projects, there needs to be a level of grant funding in place. But I think that could be a hybrid model. And this is something I'm trying to work on is, is, is sort of bringing the, the concepts and ideas around community supported agriculture and how we can apply those to these sort of um, production methods. So yeah, who, who, is the, who is the, if the market for the produce is the community and the wider community, how can they help to, to, to generate a sustainable business, um, which in this instance is, is predominantly around a sustainable cash flow to cover the cost of production. Um, so how can we do that and ensure that everybody gets um, some, of the, some of the produce as well? Um, so yeah, it's, it'd be really cool to see, and I, I get inquiries about that quite often, um, 
so that's one of the things we're sort of working starting to work on with a few customers who have got that sort of model in mind but um will be interesting to see if and when there's a return back to kind of offices um or well actually you know lancaster house is a great example you've got lots of people living quite close together um you know there's lots of people who want salad so how can we how can we implement these systems there and how can we distribute that salad in a way that everybody gets what they pay for and, and can contribute to, to, to running that yeah i think definitely definitely one for us to have a think about and probably a conversation a bit later down the line to, yeah see if there's any potential for both for us and i suppose for anybody else in this call as well that might be interested um, the next question from Michael, which you slightly touched upon, is um, what income uh, can you expect from one fully operating container? And then there was also a second part of that around, um, is it all around like herbs and salads? And is there a limit to that market? And what else can be grown profitably, which again, you've touched on slightly, but it'd be good to hear a bit yeah. more about that. So I guess this one is probably caveated, but it really depends on what crops you grow in the system. Um, so to start with, yes, predominantly at the moment, it's kind of the leafy greens. So microgreens, salad, it's kind of baby leaf, salad leaf um, and herbs. Um, it is possible to grow other crops, tomatoes and other fruiting crops and maybe larger head lettuce, but they don't tend to get attract the price points that those other crops can get. Um, and that's real, the crux is kind of, what price can you you charge for the produce and say with microgreens you can maybe charge anywhere from sort of 40 to 40 to 70 pounds a kilo um, for the produce for something like a pea shoot it's maybe only 14 pounds a kilo so depending on what how you mix up that crop um, you're going to generate different revenue uh, streams and kind of amounts for that facility um, we typically when we're doing the modeling with our customers we aim for a kind of uh, return investment of three years um, on the initial investment. And yeah, that's sort of our kind of broad, kind of broad aim in terms of how we, we get these things to pay for themselves. Um, I guess there's, there's also the other question of, I think there's a, we need a slight reshift in how we think about the kind of crops we can grow and what we define as salad and what people are happy to eat as salad. Um, so often people say, well, can we grow iceberg lettuce? Uh, and the answer is technically yes, you can grow iceberg lettuce, but nutritionally it's not that nutritious. Um, by mass, it's predominantly water, um, and so you know it takes and it takes a lot longer to grow. An iceberg lettuce maybe takes 30, 40 days to grow, whereas something like the microgreens, like a micro red cabbage, is super rich in antioxidants. It's got something like 40 times the amount of vitamin E than a whole head of regular red cabbage. Um, so if we think of it as a sort of nutrient delivery system, it's it's much more effective and it's really tasty. So I think we need to start thinking differently about how we value and quantify the value of produce as a, from moving from bulk and price to nutrition and taste. Uh, and if we can kind of get a general shift in that direction, that should help to make these systems more, more profitable and, and make a bigger market because you know, you could argue, well, one could quite easily argue there's a fairly limited market at the moment for products like microgreens. So how do we shift that? Um, how do we create a bigger market? Um, and, 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 and how do we do that? Um, do, we get, do we get corporate clients to pay for produce, which then helps to subsidize the cost of produce going out into communities so that everybody can have, have a go, even if it is starting at a higher price point? There's lots of ways around it, and that's where we need to get sort of... Um, uh, clever business people involved to sort of crunch those numbers and come up with the ideas there. Thank you. I'm definitely with you on that conversation around what counts as a bit salad. I actually got some um, microgreen seeds the other weekend, which I'm yet to oh, plant, cool. but yeah, hopefully we'll be able to give it a try at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so you got one more question in the chat from Sarah, um, who has asked if you've considered donating, or I guess if you have donated small amounts of extra produce so that people in need can access fresh food. Yeah, definitely. And it's all of the food that we produce, well, all of the all of the kind of food that we produce here at our R&D facility. Um, 
when it's kind of when it's in a good enough nick after we pro pro poked and prodded it and harvested it all of that we send to kind of fair share here in bristol so that that doesn't go to waste um and that's a model that a lot of kind of vertical farms i've seen in urban spaces is, is utilizing because you've got that constant supply of of produce coming out of the farm there are occasions where the demand for the produce from the customers goes up and down a little bit so you do sometimes get left with that spare um and i know that a lot of organizations will, will donate that produce um but again you know could we flip that on its head and we say how can we get these systems into those sort of um those environments the sort of food banks and, and distribution networks um because they could be used to grow really delicious uh, and nutritious food that could be kind of um, into those sort of um, supply networks. So, yeah, that, that that could be really cool as well in the future. Great, thank you. That's the last question in the chat. Does anybody else have any questions? I have a couple, but if anybody else has any others, then I'll let you go first. Um, so while anybody is thinking if they have any others, one of mine was going to be around, um, has there been much kind of research around if there was more of a shift away from like traditional farming towards more vertical farming about like the overall impact that would have potentially around biodiversity so obviously it would mean that there's less it'd be a move of like crops inside but presumably would free up quite a lot of space which could then be used around like priority habitats yeah no it's it's one of the exciting opportunities for the vertical farming offers um i guess there's a in within the context there's a wider discussion going on in british farming at the moment as to what is the future for british farming obviously as we've, we've now left the eu and um, subsidies are changing, priorities are changing. Um, instead of getting subsidies for farming land, um, it looks like farmers are going to get paid to uh, manage environments and biodiversity. So as the sort of metrics change, what we can do with, with vertical farming is sort of alleviate the pressure of growing all the different crops that we need on land, take the ones that we can grow in a vertical farm and do that elsewhere which means that that land is then freed up for agriculture that's less sort of aggressive on the environment, possibly more regenerative, or even putting that, that agricultural land back over to supporting biodiversity um, and that being its main function. So there's definitely a chance there. It's, it's, it's really interesting. And I guess an example I can provide is that we, we were asked by a grower, a UK herb grower, to look at whether we could grow chives in, the, in our systems. And so we've been growing um, a few varieties of chives quite successfully because the challenge that they have in the field systems is that increasingly um, the number of sort of organic and inorganic fertilizers and, and pesticides that they can use on their land is diminishing as the re regulations get stricter which means that within their crop there's more weeds growing which means they're less productive um, but it also means that they have to continue to use the kind of fertilizers and pesticides that they can um, and unless you can grow the crops without the weeds, people at the supermarkets aren't interested because, well, people in the shops don't want duckweed in their in their chive packets. Um, so it's really difficult for them. They're in a bit of a, a tricky space. Um, but if they can grow chives in a vertical farm without any weeds, um, it's a really interesting business case for them and something they're really interested in. Um, and the question is then, well, then what do they do with that that space that they were growing chives on in the, in the field system? So. Yeah, it's there is definitely an opportunity there for that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, it definitely sounds like the future is moving towards more of kind of a hybrid between these more like traditional farms and then vertical yeah. farms where it sounds like there's loads of ways that those can be a lot more efficient and productive. I I yeah. had I think that sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was just gonna say I think that's exactly the term. It's you know, it's a hybrid approach. There's no one, you know, one size fits all approach, it's not gonna work here or it's not to say that vertical farming is going to replace you know other forms of farming all the time but if we're looking at different ways we can contribute then it has to be part of a, of a diverse mix of, of agriculture yeah I can see molly has just put a hand up molly do you want to come on the microphone hi i'm molly oh, I'm, I'm, hello. sorry i was late i was i was in a compulsory housing 
conference. Hi. <laughs> I must have bored today. I don't know what I got that for. Anyway, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so thank you. Yes, love it. I went to Growing Underground with um, another resident, uh, Dougal, with Clapham. Um, right. Work. You've talked about this, have you? No. And it was absolutely fascinated me. I mean, it really fascinated. It was just amazing. And the product, I think yeah. this is important to say, was absolutely amazing. And they do sell it. I have consequently been to Whole, Whole Foods, which they sell it. It was amazing. We've got in the office, very humble, we've got a click and grow. And everybody gravitates towards the click and grow. We've done it for about a year now. Um, you know the photo of the click and grow. You can yeah. see them everywhere now. Um, so anyway, I'm jumping in late. You've probably talked a lot. Any possibility of doing a bit here? <laughs> I'm the gardener. Right. Uh, any possibility of having a small wall? I mean, somebody who came here said they went to China where it, you know, we got a big long corridor and in their office space, they've got all sorts going. But um, I was wondering yeah. if there's any possibility of doing something on a small scale here as an example of what you can do. Rather like the click and grow, the click and go, you know, so many people go, oh, you know, Google it, buy their own, you know. Um, I'll leave it there. I think I've asked my question. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. I think at the moment our our kind of systems are, are more scaled towards the kind of commercial scale installs at the moment. It's difficult for us to de demonstrate the aeroponics at a smaller scale. And actually, I think. Yeah. Fair enough. They're quite high, high maintenance for that scale, but definitely things like the click and grow um, are perfect. And there's no reason why there's a, there's a whole number of sort of um, kind of hydroponic kits and sets that you can use to demonstrate it in a fairly low tech and cost efficient way and get the same amazing results back in terms of engaging and delicious produce. Um, and specifically with things like the microgreens, I think they've got a really, you know, they sometimes get a bit of a bad rap in terms of their that sort of like fancy food that chefs use. But as you noted from the growing underground visit, they are incredibly delicious and very nutritious. Um, but more importantly, in terms of kind of getting people growing, they're incredibly easy. So I, I've I kind of I've as a little side hustle, I have a company called Pirate Farms that does uh, grow kits and you know a packet of like little red radish seeds on some wet tea towel. And you can grow microgreens and they can grow in as little as sort of 10 days. And so especially for children who want to be engaged and see the fruits of their labor, to be able to grow and harvest and eat something in 10 days is amazing. Um, where, you know, I've been trying to grow tomatoes for the last two, two years in my garden. And every year they get to a point where they look like they're about to be delicious. And then I get tomato blight from the, well, I don't know. Yeah, it's lots, it's and it's, it's really just demoralizing. Um, and I think to get more people interested in horticulture and gardening and agriculture and growing their own produce, you need success stories and instant success can be achieved with something like a microgreen. Um, um, could, yeah, could you, you, so I'm sorry, I've just, uh, you say you sell, you sell versions of Click and Grow, a kind of version of it. Is that right? Is that what you just said? Yeah, well, I can definitely, if you can, you, can, can you email you, me after, I can definitely help put you into the yeah, right. Because we might buy one here for here. Yeah, I can put we'll you in the right here. Um, As I say, we have a lot of volunteers. We're going to start doing kids gardening. I mean, in a way, what you're saying is we've all done it as kids. I mean, crest, crest, water crest. Exactly. <laughs> put it it's on. In its purest form, that's what it is. Yeah. And um, which is actually very nutritious. I always, I mean, you can probably correct me, but I, you know, the reason a lot of people don't buy that 20p bag of water in, in a shop because they think it's because it's 20p it can't be it's got if you sold it for four pound fifty they'd probably sell more you know <laughs> does that make sense people think yeah. things are cheap they're not nutritious yeah sad but um yeah we should order one and um very much like to to bring all this information which i've come to late to our volunteers to inform them and empower them with it yeah it's brilliant yeah well i think this this has been recorded so we can share that and um, maybe sometime in this year, um, Hannah or Nat Natalia might be able to arrange a visit because, um, yeah, we'd be more than welcome you to come, come here to a and talk. have a look at what we Yeah, Bristol's I think it definitely place, but, sounds like a good idea. Yeah, good place to come yeah. visit in the summer, lots of growing initiatives. Yeah, yeah, let, we will try and get something booked in. And yeah, Robert, I'll send you the link to the recording after so that you can watch anything back you missed. 
Um, so aware that we're at four o'clock now and probably lots of people will have other things to run to, potentially Oscar included. Um, does anybody have any last questions? But I'm sure if you do have any, which will take a bit longer to chat, I think Oscar will probably be happy to take any questions if you want to just get in touch directly or ask one of us and we can pass it on. Um, but if nobody has got anything immediate now, then I will close here today. But thanks again, Oscar, for a really interesting presentation. And thanks, everyone, for your good questions as well and for coming to watch. Um, so I said this will be recorded put on our YouTube and on the um, Lankwest website as well. So if you missed any of it or you know anyone that would be interested in watching it back, we can send uh, the link, I'll put a link in after this and Natalia has also just put in a link to the feedback forms if everybody gets the opportunity to fill that in then that would be really good as well. But yeah, thanks again everybody, appreciate your time. Yeah, cheers guys. Thanks. We'll be in touch Oscar. Cheers then. Bye, Peace thank soon. you everyone. Bye.